Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm going to say there's only time to mention a fraction of Dr. Allen's accomplishments. Uh, so if you would like to know more, uh, there's a little bit more about him just in his author bio on the Corwin site. Um, Lionel E. Allen Jr. is the author of the new Corwin book, Lead with Care, Strategies to Build Culturally Competent and Affirming Schools. And this offers a framework for the courageous school leadership our students deserve. And that is just out in June. Dr. Allen is a clinical assistant professor of educational policy studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he teaches a signature pedagogy course on cycles of inquiry, organizational change, and co-leads the full year residency course for uh, expi aspiring school leaders. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience as a teacher, an assistant principal, a principal, and chief academic officer, He's an education reform consultant, a principal coach, uh, a frequently invited and in-demand speaker. In 2005, he was selected by U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan to become the first turnaround principal in Illinois. Uh, he's also the founder of Ed Leaders Matter, a consultancy that aims to improve schools by developing school teachers. And under that umbrella, he's provided professional development and coaching to hundreds of school leaders, scores of schools, and school districts nationwide. Uh, you can see from all this that he truly, truly works with educators. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can also go to www.letsleadwithcare, all one word, dot com. Okay, I think I'll turn that over to you, Dr. Allen. Good afternoon and greetings from the South Side of Chicago. Uh, very happy to be here with you um, this afternoon, evening, depending on where uh, you are zooming in from. I want to begin by just thanking everyone uh, for being here. We know that this is a very busy time of year for educators. So thank you for deciding to spend a few moments um, with me this evening. And I pray that this is going to be a wise investment of your time. I want to thank Corin, uh, particularly Pam Berkman, for providing me with this platform to be able to share my experiences as a turnaround principal, but also to talk with you uh, about the book. Um, I have spent uh, the entirety of my professional life in the field of education and feel very fortunate to be able to do so. Um, I think I was called to this work very early in life. I would say probably about 15 or 16 years old, but it wasn't until uh, my junior year of college that I accepted the calling and decided to, to jump two feet into the, to the field of, of education. Um, this evening, I want to uh, share what I've learned uh, from my experiences as a turnaround principal much of it documented uh, in my new book, Lead with Care Strategies to Build Culturally Competent in the Farming Schools. I have three objectives uh, for this webinar. Uh, first, I want to detail the power and the potency of school culture and transforming the lives of our children. Um, second, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, the CARE framework, and I'm going to say uh, a lot more about each pillar of the framework uh, in just a few minutes. And most importantly, I want to uh, operationalize each pillar of the framework. So I know as a former teacher uh, and as someone who leads professional development, that the challenge in providing high quality uh, PD experiences for teachers um, is they sit and they are sort of bombarded with all of this new knowledge without a clear understanding of how to put it into action. Uh, so my hope uh, through this webinar, but also through the book, is that you learn something that you can take back to the ranch and immediately implement. Uh, the beauty of this framework is in its simplicity. Uh, it does not require you to invest thousands of new dollars in technologies or new curriculum products. What it does require uh, is that you begin to interrogate your mindsets and to engage in critical self-reflection on your own practices as educators. So a lot of what uh, I'm going to share with you tonight really is about the work that we have to do on ourselves um, as educators. Um, we are uh, great at pointing out the new latest hot thing and saying that this is the thing that's going to help improve our schools. Th this is the thing that's going to help improve the lives of our students. And the reality is the power to transform our schools, the power to transform the lives of our students in substantive ways uh, really is within us. So if you don't remember anything else that I share uh, during this webinar, remember 
that the power to transform the lives of, of students uh, in meaningful ways within the school context, it lies within you. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, uh, this evening. Uh, so the, the CARE framework, um, cultural responsiveness, affirmation, relationships, and empowerment, is all about how we can transform uh, our school cultures to uh, increase the likelihood that all students have an opportunity uh, to succeed. And so the, the, the theory of action is pretty clear and unequivocal. Um, if schools establish a culture that rests upon the pillars of cultural responsiveness, affirmation, relationships, and empowerment, I'm arguing that they will dramatically improve the academic experiences of historically marginalized students. Um, this isn't about improving outcomes directly. I, my assertion is that as we improve the academic experiences of students, the outcomes will take care of themselves. I want to begin uh, before I launch into a, an explanation and an unpacking of the framework itself. I, I want to begin by talking about why school culture matters. And I think we, we know this intellectually, uh, but what we fail to do as educators at scale uh, is to be deliberate and intentional uh, about creating the kind of school culture, the kind of environments that guarantees that every child has an opportunity to be successful within our schools. And when I say all children, I mean all children, regardless of their racial identity, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of their uh, uh, cultural identity, it, it, it shouldn't matter, right? Zip code that they live in, none of those things should dictate whether or not a child has an opportunity to be successful within our schools. And, and so it's important that we begin to think about how do we create the structures? How do we create the environment that allows every child to feel seen, heard, loved on, valued, and affirmed? And we're going to talk about uh, that more in just a few minutes. Um, so let's talk about why school culture is, is so important. Uh, I believe, and I hope that you believe this too, uh, that school culture is essentially the soil uh, from which our students grow from. And uh, if our soil is toxic, if the culture of our schools are toxic, then our students won't have an opportunity to grow. Everything starts with the health of our culture, right? You show me an underperforming school with uh, uh, disparate achievement rates and disproportionality, I'll show you a school where the culture is sick and dysfunctional. And rather than us take ownership of that as the adults who are responsible for leading the school and making sure uh, that the, the school is designed in ways that gives every child a fair shot, what we've done in many instances is we've blamed our children and our families for the failures of the systems that we put in place that we are responsible for disrupting within the school context. And so this framework that I'm sharing with you this evening, it's a call to action. Uh, it, it is a call to action to accept responsibility and ownership for the one thing that we can control in our schools. We don't control the results. We don't control the, the children that parents send to us every day. Right. Parents send the best child that they have to school every day. Right. We don't get to control that. We don't get to control what's happening outside of our school walls. We don't get to control what's happening in our neighborhoods necessarily. But we do control what happens within the four proverbial walls of our school. And that's where the culture is. That's the that's the lifeblood of the school. And so when we take greater ownership of that, when we when we identify the toxic nature of our culture, then we can do something about it. And so I want us to begin to think about how we can interrogate our own practices. And again, as this wise sharecropper, you know, reminds us of when a farmer is trying to grow corn and the corn is not growing, they don't blame the corn. A gardener does not blame the plant when the plant is not growing. What, what the gardener and the farmer says is we have to look at the soil. We have to look at how much sunlight right, that we are directing towards this, this plant, or, or to this, this crop. They take ownership of creating the environment necessary uh, for those crops, for those plants to grow successfully. And we have to do the same thing uh, within our schools. We also know that culture is important because as, as 
Peter Drucker reminds us, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So we are rife with strategies in the field of education. Um, we have access to, to the newest technologies. We, we, we spend money, we invest money in one-to-one -one programs so that every child has a laptop and every child has a, an iPad and we furnish every classroom with smart boards and we have the access to the latest, greatest curriculum resources. But it doesn't matter what strategies we leverage, doesn't matter what technologies we have available in our schools if the culture is not designed to allow those strategies to take root within our school. Those of us who've been in the field of education understand that no matter how much money we spend on those ancillary things, that our ability to positively transform the lives of students will always be contingent upon the hearts and the minds of the adults who are responsible for their growth and development. That if we wanna improve our schools and improve the lives of our students, it starts with the hearts and the minds of the adults that's in the building. Those who are the shapers of the culture, Right. Strategies are simply a tool. Right. Curriculum is just a tool. An iPad is just a tool. And if you put the tool in the hands of the right person, beautiful things can happen. Magnificent things can happen. But if you put the tools in the hands of the wrong person, a person whose heart and mind is not right for the work, then destruction can happen. Right. You put a, a hammer in, in the hands of a carpenter, they can make magical things happen. You put it in my hands and I'm going to destroy some stuff. Right. And so that has to be how we think about about culture and, and its strength and its, and its potency. Excuse me. We also have to acknowledge that when our cultures are not designed to embrace our children. When our children feel othered within our schools. When they feel less than their peers, when they are not embraced by the village. That is our school. They will begin to act out. And they will seek the attention that they long for and that they deserve in unproductive and sometimes destructive ways. So I'm reminded of this when I see this quote, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to fill its warmth. They will feel the warmth of the village. They will uh, get the attention that they deserve. But we want our children to seek that attention out in ways that are productive, in ways that, that's going to help strengthen our school culture and not undermine it. So as we think about this framework, I want you to be considering the, the current culture of your school and how maybe this framework can help improve the experiences, not just of, of our students, which is of utmost importance, but of our families as well. So let's start by unpacking the C of the care framework, which is cultural responsiveness. And the guiding question for us to consider is how can we create a school and classroom environment that acknowledges, responds to, and celebrates students' cultural diversity? The operative terms here are acknowledges, responds to, and celebrates. Because as Gloria Lassen Billings tells us, cultural responsiveness is not just putting up pictures of people of color in the hallways so that students sort of passively see themselves represented in a really inauthentic way. It's not just about having a couple books written by Black authors or Latino authors uh, in the classroom. It's not just about celebrating the accomplishments and contributions of uh, certain groups of individuals uh, during a cultural awareness month. It, it's more than that, right? It's about making sure that students see themselves represented in all aspects of their learning. It's about making sure that every child, regardless of racial identity, regardless of cultural identity, regardless of socioeconomic status, have full and equitable access to the full depth and breadth of the academic experience. That's what cultural responsiveness is, right? It requires that, that teachers see cultural diversity as an asset. And I wanna be clear, when I say teacher, I'm talking about all the adults in the building. Every adult that a child encounters throughout their school day, starting with the bus driver is a teacher 
in my opinion. They're looking to those adults for examples and models of how to behave. And so every adult, every educator, regardless of, 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 of title, have to see within a culturally responsive school, have to see cultural diversity as an, as an asset, something that enriches the learning experience, that adds vitality to the learning experience. Culturally responsive educators reject this idea of colorblindness. They see color. And they see color in their students because we live in a country where a student's racial identity impacts the way they interact with the world, but also how the world interacts with them. And if we aren't willing to acknowledge that, then we are doing more harm than good. They reject this idea of sameness, right? That we don't treat children the same because children aren't the same. They might be in the same grade. They might be dealing with similar social issues. But they are not the same. We should not treat them as such. Culturally responsive educators reject stereotypes. And we all hold stereotypes and biases when we walk into an educational context. You know, we've been socialized in that way to believing certain things about certain groups of people. Even if we don't necessarily know those things to be true, we buy into them because of the power of, of socialization. So it's important. Remember, we talked a few minutes ago how important it is to think about mindset. Right. All of this comes down to what's in your heart and what's in your mind. And so if you are a, a teacher, for example, uh, that, that says something like or believes that, you know, I don't see race. And so you're going to treat every child the same, regardless of their racial identity, regardless of what's happening in their personal lives. If you aren't going to be responsive to the individual and unique needs of, of the students that you having your classroom that you are responsible for more times than not you're doing more harm uh, than good now let's talk about a couple of ways um, that we can operationalize uh, cultural uh, responsiveness uh, the first example and again i have more examples to share there are many more in the book i'm just going to give you two or three for each pillar of the framework this first example of how we can become more closely responsive in our schools is for educators to participate in or facilitate a community walk. Uh, I tell people all the time that as a young principal, I was 28 years old when I became the first turnaround principal in the state of Illinois. And by far the best professional development experience that I had uh, was my participation in the community walk. And let me explain why. One, it helped me to better understand the challenges that my students face outside of the walls of the school. I'm from the south side of Chicago, and the school that I became principal of was also on the south side of Chicago. That did not mean that I had a deep and intimate understanding of that community. That the community walk opened up an avenue for me to become more deeply entrenched with understanding the nuances and the intricacies of the particular neighborhood that I led in. And it was important for my teachers to see that as well, to walk the same streets that students will walk on their way to school in the morning, to walk past, in my case, the vacant lots and the abandoned homes, to see what that felt like. Right? It was important for them to understand what that experience was like. But it was also important for all of us to see the assets in the neighborhood that what you read in the newspaper or what you saw on the news last night is not a full representation of this neighborhood, that there are beautifully committed people to this community who want to see it improve, who are vested in this neighborhood, who, who are providing resources to members of the community that you don't hear about. It's important for folks to be able to see that, to understand that, hey, this isn't just a community of struggle, there are great things happening here, right? And so it forces educators to confront some of the stereotypes and biases that they might have about that particular neighborhood. And it's important that all of us do that, that we are constantly engaged in practices that force us to question how we know what we know and why we know what we know. And as culturally responsive educators, we have to be willing to do that. 
Another way that we can build cultural responsiveness in our schools is to make sure that we are intentional about hiring teachers that are representative of the student population. Representation matters. And we must be committed to making sure that our students see themselves in their teachers. Now, I know that there are tremendous barriers to this. We won't get into that conversation, but there are there are barriers and I recognize it. I know that as a principal and later as a as a, a chief academic officer of a network, I know how difficult it was to to find uh, teacher candidates of color who wanted to go into the profession. Like I understand that if you find it difficult to, to hire teachers of color and staff members of color, then you got to start to grow your own. And in the book, I talk about ways in which school leaders in particular, and also teacher leaders, can begin to grow their own. There are teacher assistants and paraprofessionals and folks who are committed to that school and committed to your community, who have given the right tools, can make their way right to a degree in, in the field of education and can come back and, and teach. So there are ways, certainly, for us to do that. Another uh, example, a way to operationalize this idea of cultural responsiveness, it's the shadow of student. I encourage every teacher, and I don't know if this is in the professional development budget, but I encourage every teacher to take a day and shadow a student. There are a number of benefits to that. One being, it makes you more empathetic. You have an opportunity to see what it's like being a student in your school from the student level. We always think that we know because we are teachers or because we are educators or because we have degrees and we've been legitimized by educational institutions, we think that we know. But oftentimes we don't know. We don't know what the experience is like. We don't know what it's like to be a student who on Friday, because they have seven academic periods in the day, they have seven projects or seven tests that they have to take in that one day. You don't necessarily know that unless you shadow the student. It forces you to, to, again, get down to the student level and to begin to see and experience school, not from the perspective of someone who graduated from school 20 years ago or 15 years ago. It forces you to see what the experience is like today. And that, again, breeds greater empathy, greater understanding, and more of a willingness to support the needs of the children that we serve. The A of the CARE framework is affirmation. And essentially, I want everyone to be thinking about the students in your school and whether or not they feel good about who they are when they enter your school or classroom. Right. Affirmation is about celebrating, honoring, protecting and cultivating the identities of our students. It's about making them feel loved and validated. It's about honoring who the student is and not devaluing them or being angry with them because they're not who we want them to be. I can't say it any plainer. Every child deserves to feel good about who they are. And in a time in society where students are bombarded, they are bombarded with, with social media that tells them that they're not good enough. That's why we have such high rates of depression and suicide amongst our young people because they're constantly being told that they're not good enough. They're constantly comparing themselves to others. And we know that comparison is the thief of joy, that the minute you start to compare yourself to someone else, then you begin to feel bad about yourselves. Well, students, our children are constantly comparing themselves to others. And so we don't, in our schools, if we don't create the type of environment where they begin to feel good about who we are, we don't combat that, then we'll continue to have the high rates of teenage depression and the high rates of teen suicide that we're currently seeing. So there are a couple of ways that we can affirm our students. And this is something that I did as a, as a, as a principal. When I was principal of the Sherman School of Excellence on the south side of Chicago, every morning, every morning, in all grades, we began the day by having students recite the student creed. This creed was written by Dr. Chika Akua. And I'm not going to read the creed to you, but I will say this. When I took over Sherman, our students had to bear the burden of a school being closed and a school being labeled a failure. They bore that burden. They shouldered that burden. And so it was essential that we as a group of adults 
work to rebuild and reshape their academic identity. So every morning they began the day with, I'm a student seeking to be a scholar. The standard is excellence today and tomorrow. And we know that the more you say it, the more you believe it. I won't get into the to brain science that supports this, but we know that the more a student says something, the more they begin to believe it. And every morning you say, I am a student seeking to be a scholar, eventually you began to believe that you are a student seeking to be a scholar, right? You begin to digest that and believe it. And this is something that can be done school-wide, but it also can be done in an individual teacher's classroom, right? We can simply say every morning, this is how we're going to start our, our day. We're not going to jump right into uh, the curriculum. We're not going to jump right into this lesson because it's, it's most important that before you begin delivering instruction, that students are in the right mindset. And so starting each day with positive affirmations or some sort of creed is a great way to put students in the right mindset at the beginning of the day. Another way that we can affirm students is by praising their effort and not just the result. We wanna praise the effort. Teresa Perry calls this effort optimism. And essentially what she says is, is that when we praise the student's effort, when we praise the effort of a child, because they like the feeling that that praise gives them, they will work even harder. And as they put in more effort, they will begin to see the results. It will boost their confidence. And then eventually they'll see the fruits of their labor, right? So often in schools, we only celebrate the children who've hit the mark, right? They've hit the mark. They achieved the highest score on fill in the blank assessment, right? They have perfect attendance. They didn't miss one day of school. So we celebrate those students and they should be celebrated. This student got into 75 colleges. Well, we should. Right, celebrate that that student. But we also should be celebrating a student that is trying hard every day. We should acknowledge the, the student or the child who uh, it's almost a miracle that they, that they make it to school every day. We want to acknowledge those children too, those who are putting in the effort, who are making growth, right? And that's something that we can all do. Again, this framework doesn't require you to spend any money. It just requires you to shift your mindset from thinking that, hey, we only got to celebrate the kids who are succeeding as opposed to saying, you know what, we also going to celebrate the kids that are growing and putting in the effort. Another way that we can affirm a child is by making a positive phone call home. And this is something that as a school, we can systematize. We, we can all agree as a group of educators that every week we're going to identify two to three families and we're going to call home and share some good news. Many parents, their stomach drops, their heart drops when they see the telephone ring and it's the, the school call. Because from the time their child might have been in pre-kindergarten or kindergarten, every time they've received a call from the school, it's been about something negative. And, and students know that. They know that. They know when all the news that's shared about them is bad news. And they begin to Adopt that identity. As a matter of fact, they'll lead into it. I'm, I'm a bad kid, so I'm going to show you I'm a bad kid. Simply calling a parent or calling a family member and saying, hey, you know what? Jamal was outstanding today. It was such a pleasure to have him in class. He was a leader. You know, He tried to solve a problem that yesterday he wouldn't even try to solve. Just simply sharing something that minute could fundamentally change the relationship that you have both with that student, but also with that parent. So you call with good news. You make a couple calls with good news. And eventually, when you have to call with some less than good news, the parent is going to be more receptive. Again, something simple. We can all commit to calling two or three kids a week and sharing something positive, something that you enjoy about the child. Every parent. Those of us who are with us tonight who are parents, you know how good it feels to, to get a phone call and somebody saying something positive about your child. It makes your entire day. We as educators have the power to make the days of all of our parents in some form or fashion. And we have a responsibility to do so if we really want to affirm uh, the children that, that we serve. Let's move to the R. 
of the care framework, which is relationships. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, as I was writing the chapter on relationships, I really struggled uh, with writing this chapter because to me, it's so like, duh, of course we should be working to establish positive relationships with our children. So I struggle with like, not just making the case, but, but trying to help people understand who don't value relationships. And I, and I just don't understand how, you know, you can be in education and working with, with young folks, how you don't see the power of relationships, right? We know how important it is uh, for us to have positive relationships with our children. The, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves, though, is do we think our children are worthy enough of investing the time and the energy it takes to establishing a positive relationship with, particularly if you don't share a cultural connection with that child? And that's a question that we have to grapple with as educators. This child does not look like me, does not speak like me. We don't have shared experiences. This relationship is going to take some work. Am I willing to put the work in? Right. If we were selling real estate, we know that in real estate, the only thing that really matters is location. And if we as educators, we're selling education, we're selling learning. The only thing that matters when you're selling education and selling learning is the quality of the relationship. And we know this. We know how important it is to establish a social emotional connection with the child. We know that when our children feel like we care for them that we value them as human beings, that they will run through a brick wall for us. I tell a story in the book about how I had a group of students as part of this learning seminar program that ran a lot of teachers out of the profession. And uh, they were my students and they know, and they knew, they still know that I loved them and I would do anything for them, that I invested that, that time and that effort into establishing a relationship with them because I understood that that was the only way that I was going to have any sort of a positive impact on the lives of these young men. And I remember one time, one of my young boys getting in trouble with the teacher and I went and found him and I we had a difficult conversation in the hallway and the teacher came up to me and said, those boys never give you any trouble. It must be because you're so big. And I know you can't see this, but I'm 6'6", six, six, about 250 pounds. So I am a big guy, but my size had absolutely nothing to do with my ability to connect with those young men. It had everything to do with the fact that I was willing to invest the time, energy, and effort into developing trust and a positive human connection with these boys. And that meant that I had to step outside of my comfort zone in order to do so, right? So we know that when it comes to learning, Dr. James Comer reminds us, he reminded us of this years ago. There is no significant learning without a significant relationship. It's not happening. Again, we know this intellectually, but are we willing to do what it takes to operationalize it in the classroom context? Right. Rita Pearson, the late great Rita Pearson, told us this in her TED Talk. Kids don't learn from people they don't like. It's that simple. Are you paid to uh, establish relationships with kids? Of course not. You're not really paid to do it. I guess one could argue that you're really paid to make kids smarter. But can you make kids smarter without establishing a relationship? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so it's important that we recognize that the relationship and the quality of the relationship will determine your ability to have a positive impact on that child's life. If a student thinks that you are cool, and by cool they mean Right. In our terminology, they mean that I trust this teacher. This teacher cares for me. This teacher looks out for me. I can go to this teacher in a time of need. If they think those things about you, they will absolutely, as I said before, run through a brick wall for you. You can push them outside of their comfort zone. You can challenge them intellectually. You can give them the space to struggle and, and grapple with the problem in your classroom. Like they will do it. They will play. Right. They absolutely will not play if they don't have a relationship with you. And again, whenever I'm talking to teachers, when I go to schools and visit and I see a teacher who's struggling with classroom management, I know immediately that the reason why that teacher is struggling is because they have not put the time and the effort into establishing a positive relationship. 
So here's some ways that we can uh, establish those relationships. Here's some things that we can do. First, sometimes we just need to shut up and listen. Right? We need to ask our kid, how are you doing? How can I help you? What do you need from me? Again, we have to, and Gloria Lassie Billings talks about the, the fluidity of the teacher-student relationship, that sometimes you are the teacher, and then sometimes you have to be the student. You have to sit back and listen and let the students tell you what they need. They need that. They need that space. They know what they need. They can speak to the things that are going on. They can tell you how to make your classroom environment uh, more engaging. We have to be willing, though, to listen to what they have to say. And when we do listen, it says to them, this teacher cares about me, cares about what I think, cares about my experiences. And that's important for us. It's important for us to do that. It's important for them to see us modeling that. Sometimes we just got to be quiet. I know we're smart. right? I know we get paid to, to teach. And sometimes people equate teaching with talking. So some think that because I'm the teacher, I have to do all the talking. The opposite is actually true. Sometimes we, as a teacher, as a facilitator of learning, we have to sit back and let the, let the students guide the flow of the classroom. I used to start, and I still, and I teach doctoral students now, I still start every class with this feelings wheel that you see here uh, on the left. Right? We call it the two-word check-in. And you can also do it with your younger students. We begin, before we jump into the complexities of, I was a history teacher, so before we start talking about westward expansion, I want to know how you feel. How are you doing? And I want them to grapple with the complexity and sometimes the competition of various emotions. I want them to experience that and I want them to talk about it. It's okay that you feel both, you know, stressed, but also happy. Like, let's talk about that. Giving them the space to do so. Again, it's about how do we communicate that we believe in the humanity of our students? This is a way to do so. And it's something you can do very quickly. It doesn't take more than a minute or two minutes for everybody to, to share their two words in a classroom setting, do a quick whip around. I know as a teacher how people are feeling with what sort of mental state that they're in. And I use that as data as I am executing my lesson for the day. Again, I do it with doctoral level students. I did it with high school students. All right. It's a way to, again, communicate that I care more about you as a human being than I do as a student. Yes, I want to make you smarter, but I'm also going to make sure that you're OK mentally and emotionally. In the book, I talk about the importance of you seeing students outside of the classroom and school context. I think I called it I see you. It's important that we are committed when we're trying to establish positive relationships with our students. It's important that we go and see them outside of the school context. Go watch your students at a game. Go and uh, you know they work at a restaurant. Go visit the restaurant. All right, they're in the play. Go to the play. All right, like it means a lot. It means a lot to the student, but also the family when they see an educator investing that type of time. And look, and I get it. Some of us have our own families. And I'm not saying you have to go see every kid in every play, in every competition. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying you have to be willing to do so, especially when you find yourself struggling to establish a relationship with the kid within the school. I had a student who, for whatever reason, we just didn't connect. I went to one of his piano recitals. It fundamentally changed the quality of our relationship. Right? It didn't cost me anything but a little bit of time. And if we're serious about, again, creating the conditions for every child to feel successful, have an opportunity to be successful, this is something that we can easily do. Let's move on to the E, which is empowerment, right? And the central question here is, how are you giving students permission to realize their full potential, particularly those students who have been historically marginalized? Right? And we know that it happens. There's a lot of ways that we unintentionally disempower students within our schools. And I'm going to say just a few because I'm running out of time and there's there's plenty more examples in the book. But I, I want you to understand that to empower the students to help them realize their abilities, abilities that they might not know that they have, potential that they might not know that they have. Does every child believe that they have the ability to be great within your school? Not every child believes that. We have to change that. So we want them to feel like they can conquer the world. 
And it sounds cliche. It sounds like I'm romanticizing education and I'm not doing that at all. What I am saying is every kid should feel like they are a superhuman person about something, that they have a gift. Everybody has gifts. We want to make sure that every child knows what their gifts are. Right. And so how do we do that? One, we got to start rejecting deficit language. Right. We got to reject deficit language. And I won't go down this path because that, that's a whole nother webinar on why the achievement gap and the way we sort of frame that is problematic. But I'll say this. Right. The achievement gap places the failure of our schools and our systems on, on at the feet of kids. And so we want to we want to reject that. We want to reject the attitude gap because it implies that if students just fix their attitude, then they will be better learners. Some students have a right to have an attitude. I would have attitude, too, if I were in their situations. Right. So we, we don't want to we don't want to problematize kids. We want to problematize our own practices as adults. Why? Because we control the environment that our kids are educated in. So let's talk about what we can do, what we should do. One, we need to address opportunity gaps within our schools. Not every child has access to, again, the full depth and breadth of the experience. There are opportunities that some students just don't have access to. We need to find out what those opportunities are, find the root cause of why the opportunity gap exists. We also know that our students sometimes attend schools where they have very low expectations placed upon them. Right? This isn't just about loving kids. We can love kids. We should. But we also have to teach them. We need to have high expectations. Right. We need to set the bar. And when students come to us and I'm a sixth grade teacher and the child is reading at the third grade level, it's my job as a teacher is to figure out how I can scaffold and make that sixth grade material accessible to the child. And if I'm the principal, I have to support the development of the teacher to be able to do that. Right. It's not about lowering the bar. It's actually about raising the bar and making sure that we give our students the ladder that they need to be able to reach the, the heights that we're trying to get them to reach. Right. We also want to give them agency in our classroom. Right. We want to go from a classroom being dominated by the teacher. Charlotte Danielson said to the untrained eye, a distinguished teacher doesn't look like they're doing much at all. That tells you everything you need to know about what's happening in a classroom where it is student centered, where the teacher has created the environment where students have choice. And that leads to a very empowering situation when the student can decide not just what they learn, but how they learn it and how they demonstrate how they demonstrate mastery or proficiency or understanding when students have the ability to do that, that's empowering. I get to choose between taking this multiple choice test or creating this cartoon or creating this Civil War scrapbook or writing a song or giving a speech. Like I have choice in the matter that gives kids agency, that's empowering to students, particularly students uh, who come from historically marginalized backgrounds. Right? That's important that we do. We also need to end our overemphasis on grading. And I know this is not popular. I know it's not popular. But grades and the way we grade in American public schools, it reduces students to data points in our grade. Instead of this overemphasis on grading, let's focus on learning and growth. Again, when you celebrate a kid for learning, when you celebrate a kid for their growth, that's empowering because it makes them want to continue to put more effort into the growth process. The fact that we can go to a school and teachers within the same school and sometimes the same grade level cannot or have not reached consensus on what an A really represents is all you need to know about the problems with grading. I worked at a school, we had a philosophy of grading committee that for about 15 years and never, never accomplished really anything, right? Because what do grades really tell us? But we put so much pressure on our students. You got to get good grades. You got to get good grades. Yeah, okay, I was a student. I got good grades. But what we really should be focusing in on educators is the quality of the learning experience. The quality of the learning experience. That's what I care about. If you, if we get that part right, the grades will take care of themselves. And I'll end with this before we open it up for questions. And this is not a very popular statement. And I understand it. But I want you to begin to think about the prioritization of the academic experiences over results. I reject this notion that we have to be results oriented. Being results oriented has led to harmful academic experiences for students. When we put all of our emphasis on the outcome, 
we neglect the experience that's leading to the outcome in the first place. If we get the experiences right, the results will take care of themselves. Remember, the results, that's a lagging indicator. The results are a symptom. The results are a symptom of something deeper that's brewing within our school context. So if we want to look at the results, fine, let's look at the results. But let's look at the results as a way to figure out what's going right and what's going wrong. And unfortunately, we have not done that. We focus all on the score. As, a, as opposed to saying, what can we do differently to make our classrooms more engaging? What can we do differently to make our students feel loved? What can we do to make school more fun? We've taken the fun out of schools. I remember having fun. I remember doing a diorama in third grade. I still remember. What, what happened to the days when we created an environment where students had fun and, and didn't even realize they were learning? That's the kind of environment we want to create in our schools. I want to open it up for questions, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you all. I know that I moved through this presentation very quickly, and I apologize for that. Um, you know, I, I hope that you find uh, some value in this presentation. That I said something that resonated with you. Uh, I'm going to stop now. I'm going to stop my screen share and again open it up for questions now. Thank you all so much for for listening to me this uh, this evening. All right. Yeah. Hi. So. Thank you so much, Lionel. Um, I'll just jump in there and say I'm seeing lots of comments. Absolutely. And thank you. And you're so right uh, and very insightful. But again, please feel free. Put some questions in there in that chat. Um, yes. And very dear to your heart, Monica. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, well, OK, well, let me. Uh, maybe while we're waiting for folks to to sort of start putting things in there. Um, I, I can can start one off. Um, I was curious about what what do you advise as the very first steps? Supposing you're in a classroom, and it might, for want of a better term, already seem like it's too late. You know, the classroom management is not going well. You can tell the kids don't trust you. You don't trust them, etc. What might but you you know but you want to improve this? What might be the first couple of things? Yeah that you could do to start in the right direction? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the first thing to do is acknowledge that you're not happy with how the classroom feels to your students. Mm -hmm. To stand in front of them and, and, and be honest and humble and say, hey, I, I'm not happy with how this classroom is functioning now. Like we're not all on the same page. I've made some mistakes. And here's some things I'm gonna start to do differently so that we become more of a community of learners. And then the second thing I would do is I would I would identify the two to three students who I think are the leaders in that classroom. And I'm going to go, I'm going to have lunch with those two to three students. I'm going to ask them, hey, what are some things that I can start to do? How can I make this a better experience for you and your classmates? And my grandmother used to say, out of the mouths of babes, they aren't going to, they aren't going to mince any words. They're going to tell you exactly how they feel. And what they what they think should be done differently. And I think that's where you start. I think you start by being honest with the classroom and saying, hey, I, I want to do some things different and I want you to help me do some things different. And that's how you build community. That's how you empower students. And that's how you make them feel like they are a part of uh, the, the creation and the construction of the classroom environment. Yeah, I see Wilma says integrity start there. Absolutely. Well, it always starts with integrity. Absolutely. Uh, I, I got a question from, from Tony. Hey, Mr. Stone, with the overemphasis being placed on grades, typically state tests is not reflective uh, of those grades. What should be done to assure grades mirror uh, state tests and, and college readiness? Well, I, I think that's a manifestation of a lot of things, uh, Brother Stone. I think one, one of the issues is um, there's a lack of, of rigor um, often in schools. And there's a gap between um, the rigor that students are exposed to uh, as students, as part of their daily assignments and activities, uh, and what's required of them on these state tests. Um, so I think a couple of things have to happen. One, uh, I encourage you know, any school that's experiencing that is to really sit down and look at the, 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 the state testing standards. And, and make sure that students are 
at the very least being exposed um, to that level of rigor in the classroom. Uh, and then once we are beyond the exposure part is how do we make sure that our students can access this level of challenge, intellectual push and struggle? How can we make sure we're providing that to our students every day? And oftentimes that that's the reason why it's not happening is because we have low expectations. We are, you know, giving them assignments that are not appropriate for their grade level. They're doing well. And then they sit for, for example, the ACT or the SAT and, you know, they score very poorly. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we aren't putting our students in a situation where they feel they have an over, um, overhyped sense of academic self. We want to make sure that their academic self is, is rooted in reality. Uh, thank you for your insight. Do you have advice specifically for how to get a whole staff on board with the care mission? Said another way, do you have tips for how to change a whole school to a staff mindset of care? Uh, slowly and deliberately. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesse, it starts with having um, staff members engage in critical self-reflection because this is self-work. It's self-work. So uh, the beginning of the process, uh, I would sit down uh, with my staff members and ask them, like, let's really talk about our feelings and our thoughts and our ideas about the education of historically marginalized students. And a lot of times when people hear that, they immediately think African-American or Latino. And, but I'm talking about any student from a historically marginalized group, right? I'm talking about English language learners. I'm talking about poor white kids who live in rural America. Like those kids are other than schools as well. So I think it starts with that critical self-reflection. Let's examine our feelings about um, children who need us most. And then let's start by uh, articulating some commitment. Like, what are some things that we know that we can do that we have the power to change immediately? And I would start there, and then I would launch into this care framework where we're unpacking what each of these pillars mean and how we can, again, operationalize that within, within the school. Uh, any advice on how to... Thank you so much, uh, Louise. I appreciate th that comment. Uh, any advice on how to encourage student achievement and learning when schools have tests and grades for college? Yeah, so you... I think what you're implying, Katie, in your question is, right, grades aren't going anywhere. Like colleges want to see GPA and they, they want to see standardized test scores. Yes, absolutely right. Um, that's important. I, I'm not in any way implying or insinuating that we we get rid of grades. I would like to, but, you know, that that's going to be the start of the revolution. So we can't do that yet. I recognize that. But what we can do within our classrooms, we can say to students, hey, grades are important. Yes, your GPA matters, but in this class, I'm going to focus much more on your learning because if your, your experience in this classroom is rich with learning, if it's robust with active, engaged learning, then the grades will come. And I think what, what we've done is we force students to believe that, you know, I just got to you know do all my homework and I got to be compliant and I'll get the good grades. And in some instances, that's the case. What we want students to have a thirst for is not a good grade. You know, it used to bother me when the student would ask me first day of classes, what I got to do to get an A. Because that showed me they didn't care anything about the learning that was going to take place in the classroom. And so what we want to impress upon our students is the grades are important. Yes, they, they open up doors for you. But what's most important is the quality of the learning. And that's what we're going to focus on in this classroom. Here's how we do it. Uh, Francisco asks, um, Empowerment is the key in the classroom. How can I do a self-check to ensure that I am empowering students daily? I would simply ask your students, Francisco, simply ask them, de define, uh, have them to define what they believe student empowerment is. What, what would they like to do or what could you do um, where they will begin to feel more empowered? So I would start there. Um, certainly, and I appreciate, you know, you want to do the self-check. So many of our problems can be solved if we just ask our students, right? They are a rich source of information. And as I said before, they don't play politics. So they will tell you exactly what you need to hear and sometimes what you might be uncomfortable hearing. But I would start there. Uh, Wilma, don't feel sorry. Can you have empathy but help them to do better? Absolutely. Uh, I think this is Monica. Are we getting a certificate today? Monica, I think it's going to be emailed to you. Um, they say, and then Maya, uh, hey, Dr. Sather, can you provide more concrete examples on how to improve student agency if staff might be reluctant? Well, so, I, I, you know, a couple of concrete examples that, that come to mind is one is, is choice, 
right? Like giving students the ability to choose what they are reading, um, giving students the ability to choose how they demonstrate understanding or proficiency. Those are two sort of concrete examples that, and we do it all the time with, with, with youngsters when we're doing guided reading groups or when we're doing readers workshop, like those students have access. They can decide what station a lot of times they want to go, what center they want to visit. Like, so we have examples of, of students having agency as young as kindergarten, first grade. We take that agency from them when they get older, I think out of, out of fear. Right. And so those are just a couple of things that we can do right now. If a student is it has a, a, this a choice on how to, uh, you know, present a certain topic to show mastery, like that's that's an example of agency. Um, but you, you, you mentioned that staff might be reluctant. I would begin this conversation with, with them around. Why are you reluctant? Why are you reluctant to give students agency? If I if I told you that agency will increase age, uh, engagement, agency increases engagement, agency will reduce your disciplinary infractions, and you tell me you're still reluctant, I want to unpack that with you. I want to understand why that is in fact the case. So that th that's what I would do, uh, Doctor Sather, to to address that. Um, I see. I believe everything needs to be seen in all all steps of the emotional academics. Absolutely, Margaret, one hundred percent. 100%. Uh, uh, Tony Stone says, I've noticed that academic gaps among our subpopulations, regardless of socioeconomic status, are the same. In addition, where the scores are high, but the gaps are the same. How can we close the gaps? Um, well, so so this gets back to a comment I made earlier uh, about the achievement gap. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have to realize is um, if we improve instruction for, for our entire school, Kids are going to be performing at various levels. The expectation that all kids are going to be performing at the same level is, is just not rooted in reality. Like kids grow and develop at different rates, right? And so I would, Mr. Stone, we can have more conversation about this. I would encourage your school, your district to not necessarily compare black students to white students who have fundamentally different experiences within your school more than likely Will, perform, will compare black students who are lower performing to your high achieving African-American students and figure out how do we address that gap or that discrepancy in achievement? What is it that we have to do to have all of our African-American students performing at this level, as opposed to coming at it from the mindset of, we want our black kids to be performing at the same level as our white students. And I, I wanna have more conversation with you about that, but that's my initial response to your question. Uh, it's 4.30, and I am so sorry to, to end this wonderful talk. But uh, yes, so many thanks, you, and, and congrats. Um, uh, so, but, but we're going we're gonna to sign off now. And thank you so much again, um, Dr. Allen, for, for giving us that, that time of yours. And to all of you who came, I think this was just a wonderful, wonderful talk. Feel free to reach out. Thank you all so much for your time this afternoon, evening. And I look forward to connecting with you very soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. You too.